Okay, cool. Um, apologies for my raspy voice. It's the Midwest air, I guess, um, coming from Toronto. Uh, welcome to my talk. It, um, it's about adopting server-side apply. My name is Dave Pertisowski. I'll jump in. Uh, I am first intro. I'm a staff engineer at VMware, potentially soon to be Broadcom, to be determined. Ooh, mystery. Um, <laughs> Uh, I work on the Canadian Open Source Project. I'm the serving lead, and I'm also on the technical oversight committee there. Um, some links. I still use the Twitter Bluebird because I like it. I haven't updated my Twitter app in two years, so it still works. Uh, for the agenda today, I'm going to cover um, kind of like what's the problem with client-side apply, kind of go into a quick overview of server-side apply, kind of talk about Knative, and then how server-side apply impacts how I view we can adopt it in Knative and sort of like the status of um, my work there and the learnings that I have. So client-side update is essentially kind of like what most controllers are doing. Also, when you do kubectl apply, it's the default application of applying resources to a server. So kind of like an example of the problem is, let's say we have a config map on the API server, and we have two people trying to update it. So the first application from, um, let's say that's me, uh, will update it. And then subsequently, another person doing an update uh, potentially can cause a conflict if they have like resource version set and so forth like that. So what does the other person have to do? They might need to redo the application. But if they don't properly update that um, config map with what's from the server, then eventually, eventually you lose and you have some data loss. Um, and kind of what that means is you'll get conflicts, or most controllers encounter conflicts. So if you see 409s when you do a lot of controller updates, that means then you got to do refetch and retry the request. If you're refetching and retrying is very dumb for whatever reason, um, you have potential data loss. And a lot of um, issues that I see or we, we've encountered is you get infinite churn. We have controllers fighting each other. One's trying to update one, the other one's trying to update the other. There's loss, so they see something's not there, they keep going forever, and then you'll see your observed generation um, spike up quite a bit. Um, so server-side apply, um, I'm gonna steal the definition from the docs. <laughs> it's actually pretty useful. Uh, multi or, so first, the fields of a single object, I kind of just want to cover this a little bit in detail. So what is an object in Kubernetes? It has a structured schema, and there's endpoints. You can see the structure on the right. You have API version kind, you have metadata, and then you have spec, and you have status, and you can kind of see that you have below that um, the different endpoints. There's also other endpoints that I haven't mentioned, like scale, sub-resource, instead of status, and technically, like, different resources of other ones. Um, multiple pliers. Um, in the example I had before, we have me and technically that's GitHub me at the bottom. Um, and what are they trying to do? They're trying to manage what the changes that they want on the resource. So what server-side apply lets you do is when you use this flag and you specify who you are as the field manager, it will essentially merge these in very cleanly because it kind of knows that hey, I'm only trying to apply the changes I need, and I'm not like trumping and overriding the entire resource. Um, and this is kind of what it looks like when you um, get the entire resource and show the fields. And it's these managed fields which Kubernetes uses um, in order to manage who has ownership of which fields. So in the first part, uh, you can see like young me over here in the blue, I wanted to apply the city and I have sort of like, let me see if this works. Uh, you can kind of see I, have the, I own the city property in this config map. And likewise, uh, new GitHub me down here owns uh, the conference field. So then any potential further updates um, to, like, with, to those fields won't necessarily cause like a conflict. I'm not gonna go super deep in what server-side apply can do. There's already been better talks to, to see, you can see it on YouTube, and also the docs are very good about um, the semantics of how it works, the details of it, and so forth like that. Um, 
I'm going to kind of talk about how that applies to Knative. So what is Knative? Knative is an open source project. Um, there's a whole bunch of building blocks, but you can use them all to build essentially like a serverless um, kind of platform. Um, found in 2018, and it's been incubating uh, CNCF as of last year. I suggest visit the website, go do the getting started tutorials, and um, yeah. So kind of the high level, what are all the components in Knative? You have kind of serving that does the auto scaling, scaling to zero, runs your workloads. Eventing lets you bind events from sources to the syncs um, so you can handle it. You also have sort of the client. It's like a CLI that lets you create the Knative services and so forth. And then you have functions which lets you turn a function into a container. All these things are can be used separately, independently. Um, and can be used together to build stuff. But I'm going to kind of cover just the serving bit. That's kind of where I have the specialty. So I'm going to keep going. Um, so I'm going to run through this really quick. So the resource model. At the top, when you have a, create a KN service create, we create like a service object. That actually is just a helper to then manage two separate objects, a route and a config. Um, config ends up producing and stamping out revisions. Uh, on the route side, you end up getting um, a Kate service and ingress, and eventually this boils down to programming some networking layer. And then from the revision side, you end up getting a deployment and a whole, whole bunch of resources, and those resources end up creating many more resources. Hey, why is this so complex? Let me show you. It's a pluggable auto-scaling system, and this pluggable auto-scaling lets you um, it's what captures all the metrics, lets you scale to zero and so forth. Um, and then the routes, the HP routes here, kind of point to this public service. Um, in terms of actual components that are running, well, let's say we have the KDS API, we have controllers and webhooks. Um, eventually, when you create and stamp out the workload as a pod, you have a user container, and we have a sidecar proxy that helps you get metrics and so forth like that. Uh, we wire in the ingress to serve traffic to that workload. We have an auto scaler that scrapes those metrics. It will then scale that down to zero when it has nothing. Um, when there's nothing, we need something to receive a request. That's what we call the activator. That sends metrics to the auto scaler saying, hey, we have traffic. And then it'll scale back, uh, back up to one or more. Um, I'm going to kind of dig into the controller a bit. So, our controllers are kind of describing like the practices we follow. Um, these, I think, are considered like best practices for Kubernetes controllers, like level-based. Um, you don't react to edges. You should be able to do resyncs of your resources and kind of take action on that. Item potent, it should always be same input, same output, and reconstructive. So if um, I need to recreate the resource from scratch, I should be able to get the same result. Um, this is where it gets interesting. So the control flow we have in our reconciliation is, honestly, it's kind of straightforward in theory. Hey, you want to list your resource and get it. If it doesn't exist, then you go create it. Um, and then if it does exist, we want to compare what's on the server with what, what we want. And then if it's different, we have to do an update. If it's the same, we don't want to do an update. Um, but guess what? We're not using server-side apply. So what do we have to do? Oh, yeah, and we also have multiple appliers, which means then we have some conflict. So the way we kind of get around it, and I kind of put like the, the fire and the poo because it's kind of like an unnecessary hack in, in a way where because we have multiple appliers, we have to know what fields we're going to be trumping and conflicting on. So what we actually end up doing is preserving fields um, from the actual resource to our desired spec um, and then doing the comparison. So I'm going to kind of highlight the contention points that we have. So we have a webhook and our webhook actually updates the webhook configs with like secrets and um, client configs and stuff like that. Um, but unfortunately there's other things that mutate our webhooks which is very confusing and this was like an initial <laughs> bug report where uh, Kniev didn't work on AKS because the AKS control plane is actually adding and mutating the mutating webhooks, adding an extra um, selector to exclude some namespaces. There's an issue down there. It seems like they're going to resolve it. 
but essentially this is an example. Um, we have a revision on, that owns the deployment. What does that mean? It means the component, the controller reconciles the deployment and it kind of owns the metadata in the spec. But hey, we have an auto scaler. It needs to be able to set the replicas. And we also have some networking controllers trying to set some labels. Um, so the question is, hey, do we still need server-side apply? If we have this fiery poo of a workaround, do we need, do we need it? Um, and this is, I think, like my favorite issue so far is <laughs> the answer is yes. So and I'll explain why. So this issue is from Sasha. Sasha works at IBM, and Sasha works on Code Engine, which is the hosted key native um, on IBM's uh, cloud. And what he discovered is that um, even though we have these checks to do this comparison, it never returns true. So even though we had all these mitigations, and we thought we're being all clever with our um, flaming poo workarounds, um, this check never worked, and the big reason why I highlight it is the defaulting, and Paul helped find that out too, thanks Paul. So what does that mean? That means that when we create a deployment, well guess what, the Kubernetes API is going to default some properties and we don't really know, well you could find out what they are, but then a new version of Kubernetes comes out and then you don't know what it is. And also technically any webhook can default properties when you create it, it can set something and so forth. Um, so I'm going to give an example. So when you do a uh, apply of a pod and you look at the manage fields, you can kind of see, well, you know what? I didn't really set the DNS policy. I didn't set enable service links. I didn't set restart policy. Like these are things that come from the defaulting of Kubernetes. And when you do a regular apply, which is like create or update, it's going to assume your intent is you own these fields. In contrast, if I do server side apply, you can kind of see that like, hey, actually what I applied is what I want, right? I want to have ownership of these fields. Um, and this is sort of the comparison. On the right, you have the server side apply. On the left, you have the regular update with the defaulting. Um, and the next thing I kind of want to cover, so we kind of cover the contention points. Um, I kind of want to cover, hey, our API, the serving API at least, kind of was um, created in 2018, server-side apply went GA in 2021. And what does that mean? Well, if you take a look at kind of like our resource graph, you can kind of see all the arrows point in the same place, or sorry, it's essentially a DAG, like you don't have arrows pointing to each other. Um, and what does that mean? That means like one resource usually owns a different resource and you don't have any shared cooperation. And what's kind of weird too is like, hey, why does this HB route point all the way to this like public Kubernetes service? Wouldn't it make sense that that might be some shared resource? And what also ends up happening is in order, because we have these like this hierarchy, some properties that shouldn't be in the auto scaling system are being propagated through our spec. So for example, uh, when the revision creates like a pod auto scaler, we say what protocol that revision is running and that propagates down because we're creating the service, right? Um, ideally, I think what would make sense is if instead the revision could create um, this public service, specify the container ports and all that stuff, and then we have this other um, serverless service just essentially owning the selectors. It can remove the selectors or change it, and then instead you have this cooperation, and then there's actually would make the pluggable auto scaler simpler to write if you want to change it up and do something else in my mind. Um, so uh, implementing server side apply, I'm still prototyping it, even though the talk kind of was a little bit of bait and switch because I'll tell you why. Um, <laughs> my rough plan though is like, I want to get, uh, replace the webhooks with apply, then we want, I want to solve the deployment, like the reconciliation for deployment to use server-side apply, then apply the autoscaler, um, do performance analysis, and then maybe we can create server-side apply um, when we create our internal CRDs and so forth like that. But from the work I've done, these are kind of like the learnings that I have. Um, so if you haven't played with it yet, 
So in client Go, you have API types. When you use server-side apply, you're actually using a distinct set of Go types. They call, they call them apply configuration. The reason why you do that is because in the existing Go types, you can't tell if something's empty because you set it to empty. Um, and in these apply configurations, everything is a pointer. So a string, if you, it's unset is nil. If it's empty, then it'll be a pointer to an empty string. Um, and then there's some tooling to help generate um, these apply configurations. Similar to how you have like the client set tooling, there's um, tooling in code generator um, project called apply configuration gen. Um, and then likewise, the client set tooling to generate your client sets, now it actually takes in this apply configuration package. Um, the tooling needs a little bit of work with custom resources. So for example, I was trying to add this to some apply configs and update the gateway APIs client set tooling. And I kind of noticed that um, in addition to this apply gen config, you have to run some other tooling. And then Kubernetes has some special code in order to process some open API output that feeds into the supply gen configuration. So it kind of needed, so I kind of copied that tooling from Kubernetes to this gateway API so we could do it, but that could easily be pulled in, I think, into the code generators. Um, so that's something I've observed. So if you kind of want to see, hey, I want an apply uh, config client and also these toolings, I would say look at this PR. This will show you what you kind of need to do at this point in time to get it working with CRDs. Um, the next thing I learned is unit testing. So for those that aren't aware, Knative has its own kind of controller framework. It's sort of just a symptom of it was built before controller runtime was around. Um, and I think in contrast to controller runtime, we actually do testing with client Go and use fakes. So we don't spin up an API server locally. We don't spin up etcd. It's really just more like being able to test things um, quickly and have that tight feedback loop when we do unit testing. Um, but unfortunately, for server-side apply, the, there's a PR to land server-side apply in the, the fake support that's in the client Go, um, like the fake Kubernetes client. Um, so there's a pull request that's been open for a while. I've been talking to Antoine, like it'd be great to like get that moving along. So I'll probably help review some of that stuff and test it out with Knative at least. But at least for now, this is I think what's blocking our adoption um, because I, I don't want to do server-side apply without having any unit testing for it. That would be kind of scary. Um, and here's another interesting thing I kind of observed too. So when you, so this managed field, when you look at it, you can kind of see this operation. It's an update. This is what happens when you essentially do a, um, your controller does an update or you do a kubectl apply as an example. And switching from an update to an apply, let's say you own the same fields as well, um, requires you to force a conflict. So if you kind of, go back in time to the slide where it linked out to the server-side apply docs when there is actually a conflict between um, two appliers and they want to own the same field, you have to specify if you want to force um, ownership of it. So that way if someone owns it, it will return a conflict. If you want it, you say force it true. Um, I found it a little bit surprising that if you already own the field via the update operation, then you have to um, do, do an apply, but I think that's what it is. That might be something that's worth to bring up with the API machinery folks to see if, like, I don't know what the intent was, but it's just something that caught me off guard. Um, probably the other thing to talk about, too, is in the blog post, the, which I refed here, which is great, um, kind of what they're recommending as the control flow for um, controllers is get the resource, extract from um, that resource what your intention is because you're able to use the manage fields and the spec to figure out what you want, make the modifications and apply them again. Um, but I don't think this solves Sasha's problem of the excessive updates. So this is where like I'm cur currently thinking like what's the best way to kind of get around this problem where I think 
this is like me musing right now, and um, I think what we need to do is generate this apply configuration, get the res existing resource, extract what we want from it, but we also want to prune our apply config. So as an example, if the autoscaler, or actually, we've had in the Knative serving uh, Slack channel, someone saying, hey, I want to pause the autoscaler for a little bit. I want to set the replicas to one, for just, just for temporarily. And it'd be great if we could like hand off ownership using server-side apply to a user. They could do some debugging, then they can hand off that back to um, the autoscaler when it's um, ready to resume the default autoscaling stuff. And I think we need to have this kind of like ability to prune our apply config and see who owns the fields to do that. Um, and then we only want to do the apply if what we, the pruned config, if it um, is different from what it's existing on the server now. Um, and overall, this is, uh, I think, a talk that's to be continued. Um, and I would also want to say huge thanks to the KH maintainers for landing such an amazing feature. Like, it's not simple <laughs> to do. It actually seems very complex when you dig into it and you dig into, like, the structured diffing um, libraries and so forth like that. There was a maintainer talk. I put it in my schedule, but it's actually already happened this morning. So uh, thanks for those that went there. And I would also say I encourage a lot of people to get involved. So as I've discovered um, where server-side apply is, there is, I think, a lot of opportunity for contribution and improvement. So um, I think Antoine, um, who did a lot of the work, I think, there, and he actually had a doc, it's like, of all the things that he had in mind of, to improve the workflow, like more tooling, more et cetera, et cetera. So I kind of linked that doc here, so I would suggest anyone, it's like a call to action. Um, this feature, I think, is like 99% there, and there's like a little extra 1% to make it very useful um, for a broad set of people. And that's all I have. Um, so I have my pouty face here, so please don't be harsh on the review. Or you can be very harsh. Maybe I won't read them, so. <laughs> uh, and that's it, I don't know if anyone has any questions. So I think my takeaway is um, kind of learn about Key Native and how service I apply can be applied to the problems we have. I hope you see that there's similar problems in the controllers that you're writing, um, and then we can rally around making improving the tooling and so forth in the upstream case community. Oh, hey. I'm assuming you're gonna take questions. I can, yes. And wow, that's the voice <laughs> of God. Okay. Um, so it seems like there's a big dance to get this stuff right. Do you have any thoughts about how the libraries could be structured to make it easier to not wander off into the weeds? Because right now it seems like there's some choose your own adventure going on. Yeah, so I've seen in the K Slack channel um, some interesting discussions, and I don't know, you should, there's going to be a talk later today from uh, John Howard, who works on the Istio control plane, and it's, I, I feel like the future, and I think this, John agrees with this, I think this is his idea, I'm going to claim it as my own now, but it's actually his idea. Um, where really your reconciliation should just be returning apply configs, right? It doesn't actually have to um, do any sort of updates to the controllers, and then it could be like a shared framework that takes those apply configs and applies them. And I think this also leads to like, yes, there is this concept of like needing to force the conflict. So I feel like even the current API could benefit, it's fine to do two calls, but you might want to control that, hey, I'm okay to own these fields, um, but I'm, or I'm okay to relinquish certain fields, but certain fields I'm not. So really, I feel like as part of reconciliation, you need two apply configurations, one where it's like strict and one where it's kind of loose. Um, I don't know if it makes sense to collapse that into a single API call or not, I, but there's a clear workaround for that. But yeah, I agree where I think with the apply config, you could kind of tweak all the controllers to make it much easier to write controllers in my mind. Thanks for the question. Hi, uh, I'm David Eads, one of the tech leads on yeah. API machinery. 
Uh, I was just going to ask if you could make time to come to the meet and greet on Thursday yeah. with your wish list. Uh, yours coincides well with mine. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I would love to talk about it, and uh, I'll let the next guy go. Okay, cool. Yeah, nice. Okay, hi. I, if I understand correctly, if a mutation webhook changes the resource, yeah. and you, in the matching part, you accept that change from the mutation. It gets to the managed fields part, and it, uh, you accept it. It says, okay, this was a result of my update, and if you are using SSA. But still, if you have lists of resources, like multiple containers in the spec part, and you have a desired state in first reconciliation, like multiple items in the list, but in the next reconciliation, like instead of two, let's say one, then you still see in the, in the server that in the managed fields there are like two, and you don't know if that two is was added there. I mean, the second by the mutation hook or for your desired state from the first reconciliation. Um, so if it's the mutating webhook that yeah. I guess you're saying, I guess to recap, you're saying you can't distinguish between a mutating webhook and, or if you were to reconcile it later on. I think what would happen is you would probably end up with, um, I'm trying to think. I don't know. This is one of those things where I would need to test it. <laughs> so. Okay. Uh, so because I've been implementing the same thing and it's yeah. still a problem. Also, what the, did you find any? proper documentation, like in the managing fields, there are these I's and V's, and I know from the developers that one of them is not used at all. Yeah, so this is what's interesting. So that field, I guess, let me show it for everyone. I'll go quickly. Whoa, this is what happens when I don't do animations. Yeah, so yeah, you can see the F and then and then those ones. Um, Essentially, everything under fields v1 is considered internal at this point in time. This is something I mentioned to Antoine, where in order to that sort of like extract and prune, I need the parser, right, for the resource. Um, what does the parser do? It, will, it, it knows like what fields are um, where in the spec and, and so forth like that. And it's... And I was asking why is it internal, and they just took the cautious approach of just not opening it up because it may, they may want to change it or something like that. So I think if there's no, for example, consensus on exposing it, then I might we might need to generate um, like our own schemas or our own parsers. Like technically, all the tooling's there and it's all open source. So if you need to just like change internal to like not internal is the package name, then you could do that. Um, but I, for the schema, I, I don't know, but I think it's all the structured merge, it's all in the structured merge um, repo, and I haven't read the repo in detail, so. Yeah. I mean, but still you need it for pruning the object. Yes, for yeah. so that's why if, they, if there's no consensus on um, making that parser public, then we'll probably generate our own parser from the tooling, so yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, stick around because I want to hear more about the, yeah, I'll put it in my notes. How does this compare to patch? Oh, so what's interesting, even though it's called server-side apply, it actually uses a patch call um, to the server. I think it's just a special type of patch. Okay. So, when, yeah, when you actually look at the Im implementation of the clients like the, that it generates, like there's, I think, like structure merge patch, which will, like, try to merge nicely with an existing resource. This would just be called, I think, I don't know what the exact um, MIME type is, but it is like a new MIME type, and the API server knows how to handle this new MIME type to do a proper proper merge. Okay, and do you have to declare the managers for the fields to be able to use source-side apply? Yes, so that's why, I like, I guess I kind of glossed over it. So this field manager, so I think by default, it probably uses your username when you use kubectl, is my guess. I, I forget now. But you can override what the field manager is. So that's why I kind of just joked said, who am I here um, as a subshell. And that's just a string. Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. So for example, a controller 
what we would do is like um, for the webhook, I could just hard code it as webhook. And essentially, if you look at the um, manager here, it's just like a, a random string. So in theory, you could have a bad actor <laughs> controller for some reason using the same string as you. Maybe, actually, it might be very common because you could deploy um, something HA and there's multiple pliers if you don't do lease coordination correctly um, doing the same updates. But um, yeah, that's just some random string. So when you do the actual, when you generate these typed apply methods on your client sets, one of the options that it requires is the field manager. Okay. Last question. You, you may have touched on this, sorry. But uh, controller runtime has yep. a method called create or update. It takes a mutate function. So when it's updating, it always fetches the latest copy of the object and then runs the mutate. And you're mutating just the, just the fields that you want to mutate and it applies immediately. So the, the time between fetch and apply is so small yeah. that in my experience, you know, if my controller owns those two fields, I'm always updating just those two fields. Yeah. And, and the nature of, you know, fetch immediately apply has gotten rid of most of those, you know, resource version, you know, conflicts. Uh, yeah, exactly. So I would say it's only when you have these distinct appliers work like that are, um, is where service apply really makes sense. If it's just a single controller doing update to a single resource or multiple resources, you might not need it. But that's when, for example, that AKS example kind of proved <laughs> that you might still need it. But yeah. And that's multiple appliers changing the same field, right? Technically, right. well, I guess, let, let me backtrack a little bit. If you, um, it's not the same field, because what server-side apply will do will merge ownership nicely. Um, so I would say that server-side apply would still be useful um, in the example that you mentioned. If you have multiple pliers multi modifying different fields, I think like think of the contention point is not the field but the actual resource. Okay. Yeah, so to recap what Evan's saying is sort of like what I kind of highlighted uh, here where you have anything. It's like your platform engineering team could include a webhook that does anything, like set some labels, set, like force instruction, like force some field. Like because it's so open-ended, you, the like fetch, what Evan's alluding is the fetch you're describing, even though you're fetching it, um, if you do a Technically, the create and update, since it does a patch to the existing resource, should be fine. But if you're doing any sort of comparison, um, you might recognize, like, hey, there's a new field I didn't set. Um, so it might trigger the update. Yeah, thanks. Last thing I want to say. On the internet, most common advice for resource version conflicts, retry, retry, retry. Horrible idea. <laughs> it's, it's, that information's all over the place, by the way. So I hope this reduces the amount of retrying you need. Like we literally have in our controller framework, like when we update status, like, oh, we got a conflict, just retry it. We have a conflict, just retry it. We loop like 10 times. Yeah, so I was, I was just looking at the control runtime issue that was on server set apply, which I think has been open for like two okay. years now or something like that. Um, and I'm curious if like you've thought at all about how this needs to get adopted into something like control runtime, which, you know, probably a lot of us use for writing controllers. Yeah. I candidly have not used controller runtime um, because I've been in, like, I'm aware of it. I know kind of like how it works. I just been in the key native controller space because one, I helped build it. <laughs> so it's kind of, like, but also I worry about um, too much adoption because it's the same problem with controller runtime where I think there's only so many maintainers for a lot of feature work that needs to happen. Um, so I don't have strict opinions about controller runtime, but um, I would suggest asking one of one of the maintainers. Yeah, I would suspect that that's 
probably hindering adoption pretty heavily because yeah, yeah, people are not using it if it's not coming in the common library package. Yeah, like I'm not advertising people use the Knative controller framework here, <laughs> but um, I think, yeah, if controller runtime supported this, um, I think the adoption would be much higher. So yeah. Oh, time, and we're ending at zero. Perfect. A plus. 